news. Tickets for the Conference on Religious Trauma, Court 2023, are now available. Also, if you're interested in an ad-free version of the Divorce and Religion podcast, come join me over on Patreon. Links for both are in the show notes. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Divorcing Religion podcast. I'm your host, Janice Selby. I'm a registered professional counselor and a religious recovery consultant. I met today's guest back in 2020 when he was co-hosting the Life After podcast, on which you will find conversations with courageous people who are deconstructing Christianity. At that time, my guest was interviewing me about the first ever conference on religious trauma, affectionately known as CORT. Fast forward to today, and the tables have turned. Today, it's my pleasure to be interviewing the one and only Brady Harden. Brady is a secular humanist, conversion therapy survivor, and queer parent living in St. Louis, Missouri, where he works in marketing and design. You can find his podcast, The Life After, on all major podcast apps. Brady has had a wild ride since our interview back in 2020, and today he's here to tell us all about it. Welcome, my friend. It's good to see you again. Oh my God, it's good to see you too. <laughs> so I feel like I am constantly like in sort of conversation with you online, it feels like. <laughs> I agree. Yes, yes. We're behind the scenes a lot of time chatting to each other about what's going on and uh, have you seen this or that. And we even uh, <laughs> were both uh, interviewed by Seth Andrews on The Thinking Atheist at one point. We got to talk with him. That was kind of fun, too. That was cool. It's like, uh, I think there was one other person who was, I don't remember who the other person was that was with us. It might have been Jerusha, but I'm not sure. I've been on his show a few times. Ah, that's me name dropping. Yes. Seth Andrews. So cool. I love it. <laughs> and um, and you also are, you took a little hiatus uh, for the life after, but mm -hmm. now it's back. And I know because I heard the most incredible interview that you did mm. with this person the other week. And you were, uh, you and your guests were weaving together how Christian patriarchy has can have an impact on disordered eating and can mm -hmm. lead to disordered eating and it, that was just phenomenal i really liked that episode thank you i mean i've been sitting on that episode because like you said i had to put the show on hold which we'll talk about in a minute but i've been sitting on that episode for a couple of years now and i'm like i really want to get back so i can release this i really want to be able to release this because as i looked at the times that we were talking about weight and disordered eating within deconstruction spaces, a lot of times it was very like thin psychiatrist or uh, psychologist, and they were talking about this and important input and important research, but there really was not lived experience of people who do have bigger bodies. Mm -hmm. um, and having a woman come in who's just like, yeah, I'm fat, let's talk about it. Um, and But also coming from a very educated and like healthy place it was i feel like that was really missing and so I, it means so much to me that you um related to that and were able to respond to it positively and be like yes this is a voice that needs to be in here yeah totally i found it so uh refreshing because i want people to know that there's room for everybody you're allowed to look the way that you look. And just because uh, someone has a larger body doesn't necessarily mean that they are unhealthy in the same way that someone who has a very slender body doesn't necessarily mean that they are healthy. So I thought that it's been a long time coming. I know I'll listen to that uh, episode again <laughs> because it was so encouraging and interesting. I wonder if you'd start us off today by telling us a little bit about uh, your growing up and what it was like for you growing up. So I came from pretty bad home life. Uh, it's very Southern Baptist. My dad was a deacon at our mega church. We are a little bit of south of St. Louis, so we're very like suburban, mm -hmm. uh, but we had a mega church. <laughs> so it was like one of those like ones that just really grew where they were well. Um, and so we were very involved in there. My dad. Like I said, I was a teacher. My mom did Awanas and Bible study and everything. Mm -hmm. So um, as it became out that my dad was having an affair, uh, they got a divorce, and it was this big, crazy split. I remember like the 
it felt like J- John F. Kennedy coming to our home, like when the president, not the president, the pastor, excuse me, right. the pastor who felt like the president had like come to our home and like counsel. And I remember he brought me like a t- Snickers bar or something. And mm-hmm. that's just a weird, like sensory memory that stayed in my head for all these years of um, seeing him get out of his big car and in his suit and walking into mm-hmm. our driveway yeah. and you know having that sit down have this big conversation with our family how, and how old were you at that time i was six or seven but mm-hmm. i grew up kind of suspicious of people and a little bit more of a skeptic i remember when i was 18 or i think it was 19 or 20 actually um i took two years from reading any book but the bible because i was tired of outside influences wow but in addition to that i sat my parents down with this with the pastor and I was like, you know what? Let's go over everything you told me as a kid. And we're gonna figure out what actually happened here. Because, you know, my dad was like, oh, I didn't do anything wrong. I didn't have an affair. Uh, but then like I was like, no, I was there. I know what happened. It's like, and I know wow. the physical abuse. And so at, going through all of that, I was able to get my own answers and realize like, you know, both of you all are dishonest, but you are the core of this, you know? Hmm. Um I was like very inquisitive, like I needed to know things on my own. But at that point, I was so much still in the faith. Um, I also realized when I was about 14 years old that I was attracted to guys, but I was never going to act on it because of the beliefs and obedience, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But when I was 18 or 19, I was able to start telling some of my friends, hey, I I, hate these words. These are like the worst cuss words that anybody can ever say, but I struggle with same sex attraction. Oh. <laughs> you know, it's like a, a thing that I, you know, would tell people. And that was my honesty. And so I never did or anything with a guy or acted upon those, but I knew that that desire was there. And it was hell working through that and just the, uh, just all the things that come along with that, all of the mental anguish and repression and everything of self-punishing and shaming and um, initiating my own shame spirals Mm -hmm. because I thought it was healthy and that was what the Holy Spirit should have been doing. So, you know, like that sort of thing, uh, but also being very religious, I committed myself to the full-time ministry when I was 14, 14. So every... Of course you're mature enough at 14 to decide what direction your life is going to go. Right. (laughs) But I was also gifted in that area. So it was such a weird thing, but every decision that I made from 14 to 28, when I left the faith was to be the best and most honest pastor that I could be. Wow. Um, And there's so much that goes along with that of Mm -hmm. having to not just repress one's sexuality, but just who I am as a person. Yeah. You know? Yes. And I have a couple questions. Um, Yes. Jump in. After your parents split up, did you, did you live part-time with each parent? So I did Mondays and Tuesdays, my dad's Wednesdays and Thursdays, my mom's Fridays and weekends alternated back and forth. Wow. That's a lot of moving around. Yeah. um, But there came a point when I was about 16 where I was, uh, you know, this is where I knew that I was attracted to guys. uh, But my dad was a computer programmer. So we had computers and all of all of us had Internet in our bedrooms. And I was, quote, struggling. Uh, If we could use that word again with porn. And I and I got to a point where I I cut the cord. I got scissors and I literally cut that cable. Wow. And then my dad just replaced it and never had a conversation, but like shamed me big time for being caught with part of my history at one point. That's a whole other story. But it was just this awkward thing where I was just like, you know what? Um, I want to not be like this. So I need to get away from this temptation. So I moved in full time. At six, thank you. I moved in when I was 16 full time with my mom. And uh, just so also, just so I can go to one. Oh, wait, I can't hear you. I think you muted yourself. Okay. Oh, that was weird. (laughs) I I saw a hair. I I thought it was like I had to press it. Anyway, um, I also just wanted to go to one church, you know, because I would go back and forth and I made friends at both and all this, but. Um, the big mega church I grew up in, they literally created a job for me, like as a children's pastor's intern. So I was like in a ministry-esque mm-hmm. role at the age of like 
probably like 16, 17, 18, you wow. know, around there. Mm-hmm. Um, and I just wanted to have like a home, my own identity, my own place. You know? Yes. And did you have siblings? I had an older brother. He's four mm-hmm. years older. Um, and it, he's such an interesting story too, because he was like in the gifted program. And once my parents had to divorce, like it was like a, a bad Hallmark movie, just like overnight, like hung out with the wrong kids, was getting involved to drugs and like got in a fight, broke a rib, like all of this. Wow. So he was very much like the problem kid. And then mm. I was like the kid who never wanted to do anything wrong. Yes. Felt, you know, wanted to just go on mission trips and all of this. Mm-hmm. Um, and so my, my stuff kind of got pushed off to the corner because uh, he had the starring role in the drama. You know? Hey, wow. And so then you were 18 or 19 and you actually, did you manage to pull your parents both together for this very serious discussion about all the things they did wrong? With a third party mediator who was a pastor. I was working mm. at a church camp and he was like the camp director and i grew to trust him. And I said, Hey, would you, would you be willing to be a third party mediator for this meeting and he said absolutely my brother even came uh and he had wow. a couple of questions too and got into it but what it came down to is my dad justified the divorce because he he was ready to, for the marriage to be over and so in the sight of god the marriage was already over so whenever right. he cheated with who became my stepmom later that didn't really count wow it's, uh, and and he she, he reminds me of someone else who was like I declassified it with my mind. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But that sort of tactic, that sort of tactic of how to stretch the truth and how to say things in a religious way, but have your own little personal spin on it and all that, that really kind of being ingrained, even as a Christian, of like, that doesn't fly. That mm-hmm. doesn't fly. Um, and back then it would have been like, oh, I need to preserve this truth. But for me now, it's more of, oh, I could tell when people are bullshitting. Um, and mm-hmm. it's kind of created a pattern for me to recognize whenever I'm deconstructing people, beliefs, religions, uh, you know, or a bill of goods that somebody's trying to sell me, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. you got your BS meter. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, can, you can tell. Oh, wow. Well, I just think that's so um, interesting and really quite amazing that you were able to get the whole family together and talk about some of those things. And it looks like you were just so earnest in your faith and really wanting to always do the right thing and and kept very short accounts, uh, you know, of yourself with God. You really wanted to um, be someone that kids could look up to, I imagine, if you were going towards children's ministry. And then around that same age, 18, 19, you start maybe confiding in some friends about the struggles. I got my air quotes going there about the struggles. Yeah, and even I was youth pastoring around then. And this came a point where I was like, I'm not afraid to talk about this, you know? And nice. um, it then eventually, when I went through that that period of not reading any book but the bible because i just mm-hmm. wanted my big prayer back then janice was i want god i want to know you for who you say you are who right god mm-hmm. every time i say that out loud it always sounds wrong but it's right yeah. um and even though it's really wrong but- oh yeah it's really wrong it just it, it sounds like a tongue twister like how many shells did Shelly just sell? No, I want to know you for who you say you are. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that was a big, a big thing for me. Um, and I ended up going to a different type of church. And Ooh. I was, I became, oh my God, forgive me for this. I have to squirt my cat really quick with some water because he's being bad. But forgive me for this because I, I came out a Calvinist, which was like Ooh. the worst thing ever. I was, mm. I was a nice one. But for me, it was like, this is the reality of what the Bible is saying. And so there was an element so harsh. of obedience and submission to that because that was the sort of language that I was independently reading in the Bible. And so mm-hmm. that was like the culture that was set up and it seems normal to me. So the church that I started going to uh, was very kind of radical now that I look back at it. Um, got involved there. I met 
some new friends and then one introduced me to their sister. Uh, she was really, really attractive and we headed off really well, became really good friends. We started courting. She knew before our first date that I was attracted to guys and she opened me up, opened up to me about some stuff as well. And we started courting. That church was all about fast engagements, but I was like, I want to take my time. So eventually we end up get engaged and then we get married. Um, and then we, uh, after a while, we were kind of influenced by the Duggars. Oh, oh God, yep. oh, mm-hmm. God forgive. Uh, and we, <laughs> we started, a, we had a kid, uh, we had our son. And then a few months after that, things went kind of bonkers because I found out she had like an Ashley Madison account. She was planning on leaving me for this other guy uh, who was married. It just, there was this just really crazy, like oh. what the hell just happened, oh, you know? Painful. And so we were going to try to work things out. I tried to take her back three or four times in the middle of that. My best friend, he was the best man at a wedding. Everything just um, passed. You just died of sudden heart failure. Oh he had my some gosh. Crazy congenital thing. And uh, just died. So right in the middle of all, it was just all this compacted stuff. And yeah. then my, uh, my ex-wife it seemed like we were going to like be able to work things out. And then things just went to shit again. And like part of me, Part of it was like me being frustrated of like, I'm kept on trying to take her back and wanting her to work things out. But also I think she's realizing that like, I'm also just gay and I'm not like doing anything about it right now, but Mm -hmm. there's just this mismatch of our relationship. Mm -hmm. Um, We get divorced and we have a son, we're we're having a co-parent. And so we're like, God, what do we do? So now he comes to my house Mondays and Tuesdays, moms Wednesdays and Thursdays, Fridays, weekends, alternate back and forth. Same schedule that I was on, right? Yeah, very interesting. And we had to find our own rhythm and we realized that we're both there for him. And when it was my family's divorce, it was like they would put us in the middle or we had to spy on one parent or oh, we had no. to testify or do this, that, or whatever. But then for my ex-wife and I was like, no, we don't want to do that. And so eventually her and I created a new friendship. And then one day she messaged me when I was at work and she's like, Hey, I, I met somebody. I'm like, Oh my God, that's awesome. I'm happy for you. Congrats. She's like, I don't think you understand. Her name is Sarah. I said, huh? What? <laughs> what? what now? <laughs> so to find out, she also went to therapy, deconstructed a lot, realized she's queer. And um, they've been married now for a couple of years. And, but we're all like Yay. really, really good friends. Like we are each other's chosen family. Like I was able wow. to interview her on my podcast. We were able to just like create this very beautiful, like co-parenting, like, son our son is first sort of relationship Mm -hmm. and cut the religious shit i mean she went through so much spiritual abuse with our old church as well like wow we both were disfellowshipped they were trying to hit on her it was just oh my gosh well and the disfellowship ask me about that in a second i I wanted to tell you something about that but like um it was just banana spiritual abuse and then that was the time that i was like i can't believe this shit anymore like the Holy mm. Spirit's not real. Mm-hmm. Um, and then all of my questions just came spewing out, you know? Wow. Yes. So give me a little uh, bit of insight. How old were you here? When 20, this was going on? 28, 28, okay. 27, around there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I'll just show you. It's my shameless yes. sexuality water bottle, a little bit of a promotion there in the middle of everything about oh, sexuality. I like that a lot. <laughs> it's like so watching a Truman if... show. That's you know, right. yes, the... yes. oh, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> so tell me a little bit about uh, the disfellowshipping. Hmm. So um, after I kept on trying to work things out and and they decided that I was not working hard enough to save my marriage, And so they told me that I needed to, quote, um, beg her to stay and ask for forgiveness of anything I ever could have done to make her want to have an affair. And this is a time where I was like, I was trying to get her to do couples therapy, but it wasn't working. So I just stuck with that therapist. He was a Christian therapist, um, but he educated me on spiritual abuse. 
I never knew what that was. And so I started reading a book. It was by somebody North. I don't remember the name. Um, but I read that book and I was like, oh, no, no, no. I'm setting boundaries for myself for the first time in my life. No, no. Um, and so you. they didn't tell me, but then two days later, they went in front of the church and told them that I was disfellowshipped, that any conversation with me was to try to win me back because I had left the fold because wow. I questioned the, and I even like looked back at old emails and stuff. None of it had to do with, with me, like being attempted to be gay. None of it had any, it had to do with me questioning the authority of the elders. Wow. So do you know what I did? I found a third party pastor that they rec- respected and I respected. And I forced them to sit down with me and him, just like I did with my parents. Ooh. And we had meetings every week for three months and went through every single step of the process of why it was wrong for them to disfellowship me. And at the end of it, they admitted, yeah, that was wrong. And so they gave me a private apology and they were supposed to do a public apology. Mm-hmm. One month went past, two months went past, three months. And then I emailed them like, oh yeah, we're working out some stuff, doing as fast as we could. Another month. And then that's when I was like, the Holy Spirit is bullshit. Yeah. Because if they apologize, the, the Bible said that they should drop everything at the altar and work it out with me. Mm-hmm. They know those verses. I know that they know those verses. Mm-hmm. I've told them like all of this and the Holy Spirit's already convicted of all of this. No, none of this is real. They're not these spiritual leaders or whatever they're just assholes with hats on wow and um (laughs) and the holy spirit's not doing jack shit jesus isn't doing jack shit for his people like of all the things that i've gone through it was out of obedience for god and to the bible and my faith Mm -hmm. and that's what got me into that situation and it got to the point where they even at that point this is before my ex-wife and i worked things on our own but like they were saying how long my son would be to each parent, And so they're controlling that shit too. Wow. And I, that's when I was like, no, no, the spiritual abuse stops now because nice. yes. I'm pulling an anti Abraham or whatever. Like you're not going to take my son for me for this Good shit. For you. Um, and wow. things got so much better after that. But, oh, but yeah, it's that same, it's just that same attitude of okay, if you're not going to listen to me, let's get a third party and let's have an equal objective conversation and let's actually talk about this stuff. And once you start getting the details out, it's like, we're done. Wow. And done. and so your uh, ex-wife, so at the time you were still married, um, was she also deconstructing and deconverting at the same time as you were? She waited a little bit. She went through kind of like a more like liberal... I did like a United Methodist phase for a hot minute, uh, but she stayed with like this liberal Lutheran for a, for a while uh, okay. and then eventually just kind of faded out. And then part of that also was just getting kind of like um, therapy for like real actual, like not religious <laughs> thing, um, which I highly recommend for everyone. Like therapy changed my life. Um, mm-hmm. I grew up in a place where it was looked as like competition. Of wow. your pastor, you know, right. So secular therapy is something that I uh, endorse. Mm-hmm. Um, if someone is struggling with issues related to religious trauma and religious trauma syndrome, it doesn't make sense to go to someone who is religious uh, to try and get help for that <laughs> type of trauma. Yes, indeed. So anyway, yeah, that's it's like going to the, books. It's like going to the company counselor and expecting objectivity yeah well, no, exactly. they work they work for the company mm-hmm. and um and also they probably haven't faith produces privilege and we don't question what gives us privilege until it's taken away or we see it taken away from somebody we care about and have the dynamic empathy to put ourselves in those shoes. Mm-hmm. So for me as a white guy who was straight passing my entire life, like, and I recognize how much privilege I got from that because now I have to like argue for my right to even be heard because mm-hmm. I have the wrong sort of identity now, so right? Crazy. Not just as a gay person, but um, even to other gay people who are religious, 
because I'm not religious, you know? And so there's right. always like these, I, I know tribalism is sometimes a problematic phrase, but like these very sectioned off comp- competing mm-hmm. factions um, that we have to reverse that <laughs> and, mm-hmm. and understand that the things that make us different actually make us similar because we know what it's like to be different, but in different ways. And so yes. finding the unique ways that, people have experienced things different than you is important, but also for you to be able to be heard. Um, mm-hmm. And so losing all those privileges socially, like literally was cut off from my community. My family turned against me and we'll talk about that in a minute. Yes. Um, so losing all of those things was extremely difficult. But whenever my ex-wife came out as queer, it kind of made her and I equal again. Like, because right. our family was like, oh, you're still sort of religious. Awesome. Awesome. Well, let's go against Brady. But then now she's like, nope, it's Brady and I are die. You know, like yeah. we're divorced, but we're co-parents. Mm-hmm. And once we became equals like that again, then we really were able to thrive as parents. Wow. That is so fantastic. And I, I like it that even before you started courting, and I've got my air quotes there for <laughs> courting, you, you guys were friends. You you appreciated yeah. each other's uh, company. There were some things about each other that you thought were just great. So then it didn't work out uh, to be married to each other, uh, but you still, now you're farther down the road and you it sounds like you're stronger than ever in the unity that you have in raising your son in a healthy way. We are. Um, I mean, it's even just like recently, like some issue that she wanted to discuss with me came up uh, regarding something that happened in my kid's school, right? Mm-hmm. And I could tell that like a lot of times we always had to like walk around on eggshells because mm-hmm. of the families her and I were both brought in, conditioned mm-hmm. us to always have to walk on eggshells. Um, and once we got to the point where like, she was like, hey, she really prefaces things a lot. She's like, hey, it's, nothing's bad, but hey, I really want to talk to you about something. It's okay if we talk about it. I'm like, yeah, absolutely. Go ahead. And then she'll do this whole thing. And then I'll be like, yeah, I totally see where you're coming from. And she's like, oh my God, it means the world to me. Because I was so worried. You know what I mean? Oh, so it's like yeah. little moments like that where it's like yeah. we're learning to trust each other on an even practical side. Mm-hmm. Um, or there's another situation where my son, son forgot something in a class and got like a demerit at school, which was really oh, no. And he was worried to tell us because he was worried about how we would respond. Oh, yeah. um, and also having to tell one parent and then relying on them to tell the other parent at the other house because that was the big thing is when I was a kid mm-hmm. was like, I have ADHD, didn't realize it. So like moving from home to home and like having to communicate everything oh equally. <laughs> and if I nightmare. didn't, and if I didn't, then my mom would get really jealous and would like fly mm-hmm. off the handles. And so it was like, it felt so much pressure. And so yeah. trying to take that off my son and be like, no, buddy, like, I don't think this is a big deal at all. So I know how to talk to your mom about that to make sure that she isn't like panic or whatever. And she knows how to deal with me. Like, we know how to communicate. She's like, oh, and he was like, oh, great. That's cool. So just like that sort of knowing each other enough how to communicate practically without sending each other into these emotional parenting you know, pitfalls or whatever. Um, yeah. It's harder because we're not married. We're not always around, but like we've learned how to do that and how to communicate right. um, and how to be there and show support for each other, you know? Yeah, uh, yeah. I, you are parenting in such a different way. It sounds like such a healthier way than the way that you were parented and and uh, than the way that um, your ex-wife was parented because you both came from homes that uh, weren't necessarily too healthy. Very true. Thank you. Mm-hmm. That's all I wanted. It is what makes it all feel worth it, you know? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I've seen <laughs> I've seen pictures uh, of you and your son, and I just giggle and chuckle every time because yes, he does look a little bit like a, a mini version uh, of you. And yeah. so, do you? Is it fun? I don't have sons. I had two daughters, but I imagine as a dad um, raising uh, a boy, is it um, like is it fun? I mean, do you guys do stuff together that you really like and that he really likes and think is cool? Yes. I mean, hardcore. Yes. Um, (laughs) I've, you know, I'm single and I live alone. Um, and so I like to watch shows with people and he likes 
kids shows yes but he likes other you know things that are a little bit more deeper and mm. like oh my god he's obsessed with simpsons if you think i'm a horrible <laughs> parent i'm sorry <laughs> but he is like he has such like a pop culture like educated wit because of that um i mean even for his like school pictures and i didn't realize this is what he was doing but he wore like an, a white shirt with a pink tie because he wanted to look like homer at work I like, oh i love nerd. it oh my god such a he's nerd. so funny <laughs> but he has such a great sense of humor and he loves things about science he loves movies um he loves writing and it we love to play video games together so i've like found what sort of video games are fun to play like on the same screen together mm-hmm. and just we share so many of those things like one of our Whoa. favorite things is just to go on walks and have a conversation wow. to where he's even like um he'll be at his mom's like hey can we just take a walk and then she'll be oh. like, yeah let's get the dogs let's go and so yeah, I mean, I he's, I, I, I am careful of like saying this uh, because I know people can be extremely like needy and almost have like this Munchausen's by proxy. Right. But like, he's my best friend. Like, mm. I, uh, but he knows boundaries and we know how to communicate and we just don't. It's like a weird little Gil, Gilmore Girls, but with like a <laughs> single gay dad and his preteen son you know but yeah. i just yeah i love him oh. he feels safe with you he feels safe to be okay. himself and that is the greatest gift really that we can give our kids is that they know whatever goes on in that world however nasty other people or situations might be as soon as they open the door and step across the threshold to wherever we are um they know that they'll be loved and accepted and cared for uh and nurtured because the world can be a cold place sometimes and apologized to mm-hmm. you know that mm-hmm. was a big one for me is like make a mistake as a parent but also acknowledge it and let your kid in on it because okay. if not it's almost like you're just performing as a shitty parent and you're expecting them to keep that secret for you and it's better to be like hey that's not a secret that was me being weak or not i don't mm-hmm. know if weak is the right word but uh me behaving in a way that's not okay and mm-hmm. you didn't do anything wrong i'm sorry you know yeah and- that's so powerful it's powerful to our for our kids when they see us in a sense humbling ourselves before them and and owning our shit the lousy thing that we did or the thing we yes. did when we were angry or without thinking and and we would never want to uh, hurt them so then we do apologize sincerely for it that's that's such a great example so i just i don't think that's ever was really in my memory of like my parents doing something in college and just actually owning it there's always the excuse of oh i didn't really cheat you know because in the eyes of god blah 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 or you know whatever it was there was always from both parties always some mm-hmm. whatever um and being aware of that and how neglectful and alone that makes a kid feel mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. so i never wanted to do that with my kid i recognized too as like somebody who didn't realize i have adhd until later like there was very a lot of sensory overload and and everything especially as like raising a kid on my own um and i'd lose my patience and there'd be times where i'd yell or do whatever never like anything violent or anything but then i would just stop and think of like god what was it like when i was there mm-hmm. and that feeling weak and powerless against an adult who's angry mm-hmm. in the same room mm-hmm. and realizing god i don't want i don't want that feeling to stick i don't want that yeah. energy to stay and to remain mm-hmm. um, and so recognizing something like that and going back and saying hey i'm sorry that was my fault you didn't do anything wrong um but also remembering the back of my mind that i'm going to be prone to stuff like that so i've got to be careful mm-hmm. um going mm-hmm. through a lot questioning a lot especially deconstruction on top of that um losing everything but knowing that when it's just me and him that's such an important time too yes yes and and he so when you and his mom split um was he like talking age should he understand what was going on and i'm wondering how how many years did he spend in church if any 
he was still pretty young. Um, so he was about six months when everything like the okay. started to fan. It took about a year to get all, you know, mm-hmm. all, all, everything sorted out. Um, and there was a little bit of time that I would take, I took him to a church when he was like still a toddler, not really quite talking age. Mm-hmm. Um, and then uh, for her, I think they went to the Lutheran for maybe until he was about, I'm going to guess three. Mm-hmm. Uh, Very but, young. But yeah, not that much at all. But um, the funny thing is the school that he got in, involved in was a Lutheran school that was attached to the church that she went. Mm-hmm. And that was kind of a compromise I was making and also just wanted him to be, I came from public school. I couldn't give a shit. Uh, she came from more of a private school and that was important to her, but it was definitely like a huge step up from the sort of private school that she was at. It was very like Joyce Meyery, like charismatic, oh. you know what uh, I mean? Uh-huh. So I was like, all right, I'll make this compromise. And the school's been good. And we've had some difficult conversations with our son, but he, uh, he knows where we are and he's processed things on his own. And he's like, now religion's not for me right now okay. and we respect that um but yeah it's like a weird little balance of like they all know we're queer we're not apologetic about that at all um mm-hmm. and they've been pretty pretty progressive and liberal about it especially knowing where we stand and how vocal i am so are, I, are I really you concerned do appreciate them. about proselytizing at all or if he has to go to chapel every day or every week or um those sorts of things or do you just talk with them about it we talk about it. We had a proselytizing issue whenever he was in kindergarten um, because the principal's kid told him that anybody who doesn't believe in God, like his dad, is going to go to hell. <laughs> so I don't know how oh, the, if that kid knew that I wasn't or if my if my kid was like, well, my dad doesn't believe in it. And the kid's like, well, yeah. He's, um, so we had like a conversation with the principal and she like apologized profusely. It was like, that's not what we're here. That's not what we're going to be teaching, especially on the school side. Um, and so we've had the conversation with our son and he knows how much religion has affected us. And so we're able to have non-toxic conversations, but frank ones of this is what this looks like, or this is how it others people. Um, and he sees it and he puts it together on his own and wow. it's really impressive. Um, and I, yes, he's going to be making his own decisions. I'm not like, but I'm also not going to be like, oh, well, this is a completely innocuous, not harmful religion. Right. Don't worry. You know, yeah. like um, he's going to know how it affects his parents, his queer people, um, and what the expectations of what a real God would be like if he was pro gay, but accidentally uh, sent a whole bunch of my community into death, <laughs> you know, and oh abused. God. But it was completely powerless to talk about it. And mm-hmm. you know what I mean? Like, he's going to have that sort of thing growing up, especially in both sides of the family. Like, um, my ex wife's uh, partner, she's had her own history of having to deal with homophobia and bullshit as well. So mm-hmm. it's there. He knows it. Um, and I don't know. It's just, it's one of those weird things, but um, if we run into issues with the school, yes, we're take them out. But until then we're planning on just having these good, frank conversations and right. um, yeah. we feel good about that, you know? Yeah. And, and I mean, that does tie in with the other things that have been going on uh, yes. in your life regarding um, your son and religion and uh, your mother. So please let us know what's going on there. Yeah, yeah here's where it gets juicy. Here's what you've all <laughs> been waiting for. Um, but over COVID, we were having issues with my mom, who's still very evangelical. She helps run like a um, crisis pregnancy center, like very pro-life. Um, just, she's a lot. Very said home, like whenever... I was outed to her. She said that I shouldn't have my son overnight anymore because, quote, if I didn't molest or rape him, one of my friends would. Like, oh that's the sort of God. That's the sort of level of homophobia and just kind of backwards. That is horrendous. Because I'm I'm in Missouri, uh, in the U.S. So around COVID, she was not vaccine. Wasn't like going through all of that stuff, but wanted to see her son. And so we just set like these boundaries now to ask questions of like have you been doing this or whatever? And then she'll be like, 
well, I don't know. You know, I would never harm him. So I don't know why you're asking me this. And it's like, I don't know what I can do to set you a little heart at ease. And it's like, just answer the questions, you know? Mm-hmm. So it's like constantly having to run around and then she would get jealous with my exes because they were able to go see some of their family, but they were like masking and socially distancing. So my yeah. mom would call me and be like, well, they got to go. So why can't I take them down to our grandparents? It was like flat out or not vaccine or not. And, even social distancing so like putting me in the middle with my ex's family not cute so like Mm -hmm. constantly just like wouldn't get the answer that she wanted from me so she would go to my ex-wife and i'm like that's so fucking inappropriate Mm -hmm. like fuck off stop doing that Mm -hmm. but then would keep doing it and then she would get like frustrated not be like brady well take care of this but like Brady, she's still doing it and it's like god damn it like so it's constantly like being harassed by her and having to set boundaries and eventually i just said we need six months of just silence because like you know i was like during all of her harassment and all this bullshit we were uh doing our son's school from home in addition mm-hmm. to full-time jobs and all so it was just like wow and me figuring out my adhd like all of this stuff all at once, I'm just, it was overwhelming. I'm like, we need six months. The end of it, we'll find a mediator. We can figure out some of the stuff, but we need a break. So she kept trying to break the six months. And then I was like, no, we have to restart this. Like, give us six months. So finally got to the end of it. And instead of doing mediation, we get a letter from her lawyer saying that they are pressing legal action because in Missouri, there's a fucked up grandparents law that says, that if a grandparent is kept away from a grandkid for six months, and only if the parents are divorced, only if the parents are divorced, then the grandparent can sue for like sue for court time, so that they can be granted, um, hopefully, like uh, court ordered visit monthly visitation. That is outrageous. That is absolutely outrageous. Wow. Yeah. So that was fucked up. So we had to get a lawyer and it just, everything it wanted us to do. We jumped through all the hoops. We went, sat down with the mediator, went through all of this stuff. My mom was caught in like lie after lie after lie, like saying, oh, I've never done that. I have no clue what you're talking about. That's her pattern. I have Mm -hmm. no clue what you're talking about. I have no clue what he's mentioning. And then we'll come back and be like, well, I did say that he shouldn't have a son overnight anymore because he might molest or rape him. But I meant it in this other context. Oh my God. And so it'd be like, so you, and so that's like, I don't allow people like that alone with my kid. Yeah. If they, mm-hmm. if they blatantly disrespect the identities of the parents, plus constantly cover up their own shame with lies and gaslighting and emotionally mature slash narcissistic behavior, constantly having those sort of patterns. That's not the type of person that I put around my kid for Christ's sake. Well, no, definitely. And right? I think I, I, she's so, there's so much uh, homophobia there that's very apparent. But I mean, what's, what on earth is she going to be saying uh, when she's alone with your son? She's, she's still, you know, got the magical thinking Kool Aid um, mm-hmm. and, and hook, line, and sinker buys into all that stuff that you guys have rejected. Uh, and you're raising your son according to the ways that you see fit. And the, I mean, the fact that you are still at this point allowing him to attend a Lutheran school shows that you're not so blatantly hostile to, uh, to, Christianity. Uh, I mean, that I was know. used against us in court. That was twisted as I get away from religion in my public persona, but in, in my real life, I must still be seeking for something. Wow. Oh Which, what the fuck does that would I even have to do with anything here? Uh, yeah. That. I mean, it, what I is mean that? how my... <laughs> dare she? That's the what comes to my mind. How dare she? Both my ex-wife and I are on the same page. You know, we're like, no, we don't want her to have contact with her kid. We don't, mm-hmm. we don't want that. Um, and my ex-wife even came to the mediation and had to like go through the bullshit with my mom herself. Mm-hmm. My mom going at her and like treating her poorly. And I'm just like, an ex should not be in this situation. She shouldn't have to be here with me right now. Well, and your mom, you know? I mean, when our parents' job 
this is another hobby of ours. Uh, our parents' job is to raise us uh, safely to reach adulthood, like physically wow. that we have survived until adulthood. Once we reach adulthood, our parents are in our lives by invitation only. That's Agreed. it. And we can rescind that invitation if our mental health uh, warrants it, if they are toxic. We are allowed to make that decision. Uh, and and agree. what you're saying is in in Missouri, no, that's not how it goes. Your parents don't just uh, get to be in your life by invitation only. They get to stay no matter what. Yeah. Um, they're all about small governments until they need a judge to force relationship in their family for them. Um, we, we jumped through all the hoops. We even got a third party called a guardian ad litem, a third party um, court ordered lawyer to represent um, our son. And so she was able to have a Zoom call with our son without telling him what's going on because he still doesn't know, which is a very key okay. detail I'll touch in a moment. Wow. Um, this weekend, we're having, having a talk with him about, hey, here's what's happening. We'll get to that in a second. But with the GAL, she interviewed uh, my son. She interviewed me, my ex-wife, my mom, all of this. And she by protest, went into the court and said, no, I don't, I don't approve of this. I do not approve of this. The judge, you are making a huge mistake uh, to even have this. Like, it is wrong for you to have this, to force any sort of visitation. Um, and so we had to wait months and months and months after the court date. We had to wait months and months for the, for the answer. Finally got it last month. That Yeah, he's rewarding her uh, monthly visitation. Um, and it's this weird system where I have to come up with, I have to curate three, I, three outings for them to last for those four or five hours. Um, and she gets to pick one of the three, but if she refuses any of them for any reason, no questions asked, then I have to open my home to my mother, uh, so she can have the visitation within my home, whether it's my weekend or not, uh, I have to give her access to my home. And it feels like such a fucking violation. It absolutely, just, yes. Because like she's denied, like whenever she would deny what she said about me not having my son overnight, she's like, that never happened, never to happen. Like she came to my home and would not leave. And I literally had to like threaten to call the cops for her to leave for her before she would. I had to grab her like her purse and put it out in the hallway of my apartment and be like, go. Like you are wow. not going to convince me because I know the truth. Leave. And she still wouldn't do it until I said, I'm calling the cops. And finally she got up and left. So now the judge is granting her five hours inside of my home, no matter what, if she so chooses. And there's just no justice. There's no there's checks and balances on only me because I'm the problem parent or and my ex-wife because mm -hmm. we're the problem parents who made boundaries. Like literally wow. all of this is so that they can bypass yes. boundaries that we've, and the, the GAL described it as, no, Brady has been painstakingly clear about his boundaries and his community. Mm -hmm. And we have 30 something pages of just like screenshots of us like going through these like, trying to walk through my mom gaslighting and pretend she doesn't know what's going on. And, yes. And accusations. Oh, wow. So one of the big accusations, and this is what, this is why I don't trust family like this. And mm -hmm. I think this has a lot to do with fundamentalism um, is the way that things get um, escalated in their brains um, in just a moment. So because we aren't allowing my mom to be around my son, my mom has gotten in her mind that we are training and we are teaching my son to hate her. Um, that we're She's doing a good enough job of that on her own. Right. I mean, if she <laughs> once he's old enough to know what's going on, yes, he's going to... He's it does, You don't have to be Harry the Spy to understand, right. oh, yeah, this woman said, <laughs> well. But because we've made boundaries, then it means, well, obviously, we're training him to hate him. And if we're training him to hate him, we're teaching him to sin. And if we're teaching him to sin... Well, my grandma posts this Bible verse on one of the my mom's Facebook posts bitching about me. The Bible verse about how it's better to be um, have a millstone tied around your neck and thrown into the ocean. Mm. And so we kind of like bypassed over that verse. My ex-wife did not really understand the context. I'm like, wait a second. She said, what? And my ex-wife repeated. And I said, do you know what that verse is saying? She's like, what? I said, my grandma is saying that it's better for you and I to be dead than for us to 
train or to, mm-hmm. to raise the, our child the way that they're assuming wow. that we are. Wow. And so it goes from, oh, well, he's got boundaries to, well, it's better from him to be dead. Unbelievable. That quickly. Wow. And, and that sort of bad faith nature of always assuming that, oh, you're gay. Well, obviously you, you want to molest kids. You shouldn't Ugh. be around them anymore. You know, oh, you are making blush. boundaries and not letting your grandma around. Them. Well, obviously you're teaching them to hate Christians and you're just doing this because I'm a Christian and it's better for you to be dead if you continue to do this. Uh, did Is the judge sort say anything asking, about religion? They, they laughed at it. Um, that, that was my, the lawyer, my mom's lawyer's whole thing is that we're doing this because I have this podcast, the life after where I am quote, crushing and killing Christian people. That's my mom's direct quote. I had this podcast. I'm just doing this because they're Christian. Wow. And when I tried to bring up the Bible verse, like the lawyer's like, nope, 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 shut it down. And they objected it. And the judge's like, oh yeah, okay. Oh, well, and or uh, sustained. And then just went to the next thing. I'm like, wow. whoa, whoa, this so is literally unfair. my family saying that it's better for me to be dead and you're just throwing it out like it's nothing. You're not wanting to see the evidence that's right here that we've done everything that we should do as parents and you are throwing him, our son, to somebody who doesn't respect our identity or doesn't even trust us as people because we aren't the same as who they are. This is so huge. It seems to me like this is a case that should be front and center. Everybody needs to know about uh, this case and about what horrible things uh, can happen in Missouri. Do you know if and not there just are other Missouri. states? Every state has grandparent laws, Every but they state? operate. But they operate in different ways. Illinois, if we just lived one or two miles east, uh, we would be in East St. Louis, and there. In the state of Illinois, they have parents' rights. And it's like, if two parents, even if they're divorced, but if two parents, divorced or not, agree on no contact with family, that is prime directive. That's That's number one. Wow. And so are there also rules about now you can't move out of state and can't take your son out of state or she's allowed to fly wherever you are? We have to give this two two month notice, then it has to like have a goodwill um, statement added to it and it can be questioned. And then if they, oh whatever, it's so, no, it can, they can. And that's the mess up thing too, is like my ex-wife and her partner are married. And if they start messing with the same sex marriage laws here in Missouri, which they're trying to do, then because of my, their ex, this is a stupid family because of my stupid family. Um, it's, fucking with their their marriage and literally the day of our trial just the day of our trial um my ex's partner's dad passed away oh like, no he had um uh same situation as dave warnock and oh, it would yeah. like produce so much quicker mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and and yeah, it, literally just hours before our trial, my ex-wife gets that call. I'm, just oh, like, wow. I'm so sorry, babe. Like, I'm so sorry that I'm having to drag you <laughs> into oh, this situation goodness. on top of everything else you're going to. Right. And it's just... Mm, that's just ridiculous. so awful. Yes, and for um, folks who aren't sure, uh, aren't familiar with Dave Warnock, he is uh, just an absolute delight and a treasure um, in the religious trauma recovery community. And he is dying of ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease. And um, I think he has called his work uh, dying out loud, if I yes, remember yes, that yes. Um, correctly. So I'm very sorry that that happened to your ex-wife right when you guys are going to court even. So you mentioned that this weekend, then you'll be talking with your son. I am shocked. I can't believe you've been able to keep all this drama from him. That's amazing. Well done. Thank you. Uh, yeah, because the whole thing is she always put us in the middle as kids. And now she's like forcing us to put our kid in the middle. And we have to break that. We have to break that cycle. Have to break that cycle. Mm-hmm. So um, the conversation with him is not. I don't think we're going to mention the plan is not to mention the court stuff, but just say like, "Hey, she's requested time. Uh, we may not speak with her, be as close as we used to, but uh, we want you to be able to do what is important to you, and 
whatever. But trying our hardest not to make it about us and the shit that we've gone through. But later on when he's older and is at an age where it's like, this is the world we live in and this is how it's affected our, our family. Um, yeah, he's going to he's gonna know those things. But for now, as an 11-year-old, that's not his burden to hold. So and what happens when she to, tries to take him to church or church things? So I still, I get to pick the, the three options that they're okay. going to do. So I guess that's the one safety net that I have. But um, So she can take him to the satanic temple. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> um, but But it's also kind of like this weird balance of, there are certain things that she's not allowed to talk about, even that, that okay. was court order. And so I'm happy about that. Very but good. The only, but the, the shitty thing is the only way to enforce that is to kind of ask him, hey, can you be on the lookout for these things? Like, but I don't want him to feel like he has to police. And also, like, I'm not, I'm not in the place where I'm just going to be able to spend time with her during these yeah. times, yeah. you know, like, understandable. Um, and I can't expect my ex-wife to be on our guard and all of that either. So it's like, we have to trust him, but also not give him too much information where he feels uncomfortable and then, mm-hmm. but enough to know that he needs to keep a lookout. It's just a, it's an unreasonable thing to have exes go through and also that we were sued together like normal exes relationships merit a lot of marriages get fucked up because of thousands and thousands of dollars of debt but throwing two exes and that who've just who've had to work for their sea legs that's an unreasonable thing from the state of missouri that doesn't add up and make sense it feels like being demanded (laughs) to hand your child over to the abuser Yes, in my home, in my space. Yeah. Oh, it's unbelievable. And so it's also brought uh, financial hardship to you because yes. you've been having to pay for a lawyer's legal fees. It's obviously taken time away from work that you could have been doing. Um, so what's how can people uh, help out? Uh, so GoFundMe, I had to set up a GoFundMe because uh, I was also laid off from my work, like no fault of my own. They were bought by a new company. They had like mm. huge layoffs. Um, and oh, I was terrible timing. Yes. Two weeks before, right? Mm. When it rains, it pours. It's mm. like 10 years ago, all over again, you yes. know? Um, but uh, yeah, so he, the GoFundMe have had to step. If you're able to give to any of that, small amounts is huge. Like, any of it is huge. If you know any famous or wealthy people, you know, send them my link. I really appreciate it. <laughs> but if you <laughs> if you look up suit by um, evangelical mom, you should be able to find it. Um, and I have some updates and everything if you wanted to read more information about that. And also, I just want to encourage your listeners to, if you're in the U.S. or Canada, I don't know what all the laws are in different different countries as well. But do a hard search in the state that you're in and really know your rights. Um, if you're divorced, you may have no much say on your family, um, and it may result in needing to find a way out. I documented everything, and it still wasn't enough because they wow. limited. Because in addition to all the accusations, it was like with Trump, where he just throws all these accusations and then sees what stick. But you're constantly like Hillary, having to like respond to all of them or you don't respond then you lose the election right so yeah. it's like that weird balance of like do i have to respond to them saying that i'm teaching my kid to hate do you uh do you have a patreon account for uh the life after podcast or anything like that or is the gofundme the best way that people could Go, support you yeah the gofundme the best um okay because when all this happened i knew that anything i was going to say was going to be used against me so right. i right the podcast and everything on hold. And I also yeah. put the Patreon on hold. So okay. I didn't feel right taking people's money without mm-hmm. actually producing anything then. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. so yeah, I'm kind of using the new episodes and stuff as like little ways to kind of um, direct people towards the, the GoFundMe right sued by Evangelical Mom. 
Yeah. Wow. I'm I'm so grateful that you uh, were willing to come on the show today and tell us My about pleasure. all of that. I mean, wow, you have just been through so much and it'll be really interesting how you navigate the conversation um, with your son. And, and I'm sure that you are already um, training him to use critical thinking. Uh, and yes. that'll be something you know, that'll help offset any very bizarre comments that might fly out of uh, the grandmother's mouth or out of any strong fundamentalist Christian I believe so. mouth. So, yeah. yeah, critical thinking is the way to go. And I just really appreciate you. If I can ever appreciate be of so any much. service to you, it would be my delight. <laughs> oh, my God. I can't ask anything else. Thank you so much for letting me be on. It was really nice to be on this side. And, like, you asked such good, thoughtful questions. And I'm glad to... At first, we were supposed to do this like the day after I found out. And so I was probably a little drunk and shell shocked. So I'm glad we had to take a little bit of time. But I appreciate you so much. And thank you so much for everything you're doing. Oh, wow. um, what a pleasure. We're your help. mutually admir admiring each other. I like it. <laughs> and I want to thank you for tuning in today to the Divorcing Religion uh, podcast. And I'll have uh, the link for Brady's GoFundMe in the show notes. I know it would mean an awful lot to him if he thank heard you. from you. And take care, everyone. We'll see you again soon. Take care, my friend. You as well. Thank you so much.